Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. I'm joined today by Dr. Ronald Mincy. Dr. Mincy is the Maurice V. Russell Professor of Social Policy and Social Work Practice and Director of the Center for Research on Fathers, Children, and Family Well-Being. He is a co-principal investigator of the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study and a faculty member of the Columbia Population Research Center. Dr. Mincy is the author of many journal articles and book chapters and is the editor of Black Males Left Behind, published by the Urban Institute Press. He is also an advisory board member for the National Poverty Center at the University of Michigan, the Technical Work Group for the Office of Policy Research and Evaluation, the Transition to Fatherhood Project at Cornell University, the National Fatherhood Leaders Group, the Longitudinal Evaluation of the Harlem Children's Zone, and the Economic Mobility Project of the Pew Charitable Trust. Dr. Mincy, welcome to Social Impact Live. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I provided a sample of the range of policy issues and topics, uh, projects that you've been involved with over your career. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, most recently, a uh, report has come out for your project. It's called Unlocking Excellence, Advancing Post-Secondary Success for Men of Color uh, Through Policy and Systems Change. So um, we're happy to have you here to talk a little bit about Great. this project. Um, but can you give us uh, at least uh, uh, some background and, 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 and how your previous research interest has, has sort of led you to, to doing this project? Sure. Um, so my major work has been around uh, child support enforcement and more generally in the role of men in families. Uh, and over the years it's become pretty clear that unless uh, we increase the educational attainment of men of color, mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to make much progress in, in child poverty. Mm -hmm. And so what, what brought me to this project was uh, the idea of how do we actually accomplish that because we know that um, uh, rates of high school graduation, the, great, the, the gaps between uh, white men and men of color have declined over time. Mm. Uh, enrollment rates of men of color have increased in higher education, but they're not graduating uh, at, at very high rates. Mm. And so the challenge is, how do we have, uh, get more success among men of color who are enrolled in college in terms of the rate at which they graduate with a four-year degree? And uh, the opportunity to then to work uh, with uh, the foundation community and with uh, institutes of higher education mm -hmm. to work on this task was what sort of brought me to this project. Okay. So, so where are we right now as far as men of color and being able to enter into college mm -hmm. and, and, and finish college? Well, um, th 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 again, their graduation rates are, uh, are less than a third of the mm -hmm. graduation rates of, of, of white men. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the more general problem is because we've not collected data, mm -hmm. uh, institutions of higher learning tend to collect data on the, uh, the success of their students moving through the system right. in order to report to financial aid, right. uh, to, to, the, to the authorities that provide financial aid. Right. And because those authorities don't require the disaggregation of those data mm -hmm. by race, uh, ethnicity, or gender, mm -hmm. uh, 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 we may know what their graduation rates are, but we don't know, uh, you know how many are, are are succeeding from freshman year to sophomore year, uh, what courses are the primary barriers to their success, mm -hmm. and so part of the purpose of the project was to uh, uh, encourage and incent institutions of higher learning to disaggregate the data that they have mm. so that they can better support students as they're moving through. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so before we get to mm -hmm. an analysis mm -hmm. of that, um, what are the consequences for men of color uh, not finishing college? So I, I think they are, they are legion. So for mm -hmm. example, the only people in the United States who have um, recovered their wages from the 2008 recession Mm. are people with a four-year college degree or more. Okay. Everyone else yeah. is still earning less in real terms than they earned uh, prior to the recession that began in 2007, 2008. Okay. And so we've, we've experienced basically uh, very little growth in wages since I graduated from college in 1974. Mm. Uh, and, and, and where we have had growth, it's among men who have a four-year college degree or more. Mm -hmm. And so everyone else has experienced a stagnation or decline in their earnings. And since the graduation rates with a four-year degree of men of color are very 
very, very low, yeah. they are in the population of people who have seen virtually no progress in their wages in more than 40 years. Wow. So this is a real, this is one of these fundamental challenges yeah. that, I, that again, we're never going to resolve these issues of child poverty mm. unless we figure out how to, uh, and there's also a recent report that was released by McKinsey uh, that talks about who is vulnerable to automation. Mm. And because men of color tend to be employed in occupations that don't require a mm. college education, they're in manufacturing, transportation and the like, uh, they are vulnerable to, uh, to um, any sort of uh, technology that can replace uh, skills that are used, you know, in a very repetitive way. Mm. And so men of color are concentrated in those occupations mm. primarily because they don't have four-year college degrees. So this is a very forward-looking, uh, 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 well, what brought me to this is a very forward-looking analysis of where men of color fit in the occupational and income distribution and mm. then trying to go to the source, which is institutions of higher learning, to figure out what can be done. Okay. Well, uh, well, you've established the critical need for this information now, and so um, what were you able to learn, and what can we do about this? Well, um, the report sort of talks about uh, you know six cornerstones to resolving uh, to increasing uh, rates of persistence and completion, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the the couple that I want to focus on for this brief conversation are the really the need to disaggregate the data okay. that we have about. Um, men of color and the rate at which they're moving. The, the, first of all, we need to better understand what are the most popular courses that, that on any college campus that mm. these students take. Mm -hmm. And among those courses, which are the courses, which are the sort of fields in which they're most successful and which are the fields in which they're least successful. Mm. And then try to figure out um, what is happening in the fields that are successful mm -hmm. where uh, that, that might be replicated in, in the fields in which they're not so mm. successful. For so men of color. For, for men of color. Right, okay. and, and, and the challenge again is that because we, most uh, institutions of higher learning don't disaggregate their data, then we don't have the answer to any of the questions I just posed. Mm -hmm. So for example, we were working uh, with, a, with a group of um, uh, schools in a collaboration in Arkansas, mm -hmm. and what we learned was, sorry, uh, in in, um, in Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and they had the uh, the interest and the capacity of the dean's office, of the registrar's office, and a number of other senior administrators at, uh, at 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 Newark, so that they were able to disaggregate their data and learn that um, the 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 students of color who male students of color who were enrolled in accounting mm -hmm. were doing much better than the students of color who were enrolled in engineering, mm -hmm. and so uh, but the common thread that runs through those two fields is math, mm -hmm. and what we began to learn, what we, the questions we began to ask is, well, what is happening in the first and second year of students who are enrolled in accounting that's not happening to students who are enrolled in engineering? Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, the, um, that uh, the, the, the way in which the instruction is posed um, doesn't enable the students to use examples mm -hmm. that they care about. And, and when I work with my own students in economics, I always work with them in order to help them understand, you know, we have these complicated, you know, uh, mathematical uh, 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 formulations of economic problems and I always tell my students if that abstraction is a challenge to you mm. put people you care about in those variables okay. and and so it could be that the form of instruction that these students are getting uh, doesn't resonate with them and therefore they're not successful or it could be some special skill that yeah. that an instructor has and so there are a variety of things that instructors can do to improve the completion and success of male students of color mm -hmm. but they can't do it unless they know uh, where the bottom bottlenecks occurring in their in their higher education and to change things in the right timing so that students move from uh, you know the freshman year to the sophomore year and so forth okay. um, so I think that's part of the problem yeah. I think the other cornerstone is uh, has to do with financial aid mm. so uh, uh, a broad uh, swath of male students of color are first-generation college students. Okay. They have they have no one in their family or even in their extended family. I was the first first person in my extended family who ever went to college. Mm. Therefore, I knew nothing about financial aid. Uh, the m uh, m among many of these students, the reason that they are applying for a particular college has nothing has very little to do with you know the the particular coursework that the college offers or 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 all things like that because they don't have anyone in the background to figure out what school I should go to, what mm. courses I should take, mm. or 
what should happen when I fail? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, if I, I, I originally wanted to be an engineer, mm -hmm. and I failed my first course in, 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 mm -hmm. uh, in physics, mm -hmm. and uh, I had an awful hard time figuring out what was plan B, because there was no one on my college campus that I felt I could trust right. in order to have that conversation with. I ended up being an economist who knows almost as much math, but, but, the, but the circuitous route I figured out in order to figure out how to how to accommodate failure or to st mm. respond to mm. failure was not available to me yeah. easily, yeah. nor is it available to lots of students today. Mm. And so we talked about um, how to create a climate in which uh, male students of color feel comfortable on a college campus mm. and how to create uh, uh, opportunities for them to get the advice they need uh, and to, pr and to promote them or to make sure that they know where to go and to actively encourage them to do so so that okay. when they have challenges in higher education right. they can move so through. I, so it's, it's wonderful that uh, this material resonates with your own experience. Oh, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering in terms of the project, mm -hmm. so um, you worked with uh, foundation uh, funding yes. right, mm -hmm. to uh, create this demonstration project mm -hmm. with uh, colleagues of yours yes. uh, to pick, I think it was six different sites, cities, where you were working with local stakeholders to look at exactly right. what the dynamics of these uh, sort of uh, um, post-secondary educational situations were like for men of color? Yes. Um, so the project was funded by the Executive Alliance of uh, for Men and Boys of Color. Mm -hmm. This is an affinity group among foundations who are, who've come together to work on the challenges that men of color face. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lead uh, uh, foundation on this project was the Lumina Foundation. Mm -hmm. And their entire mission has to do with higher education. Okay. And what they did was they identified six sites throughout the country mm -hmm. who came together, in, uh, who submitted applications that we vetted in order to figure out um, what were interesting opportunities. Uh, and so we had lots of geographical diversity. We also had diversity in terms of the types of schools that were involved. Some of them were community colleges. Some were uh, in places around the country where there were where public education has a large footprint. So mm -hmm. we were looking for diversity by region, uh, by and by the the race and ethnicity of the men in color, of color with whom we were working. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, there, there are six different sites in several different parts of the country, and, and each of the sites taught us something different. Okay. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Before I mm -hmm. ask you my follow-up question, mm -hmm. I just wanted to remind our audience mm -hmm. that uh, if you have any questions, mm -hmm. please write them in um, to Facebook, and we'll bring them up and, and ask mm -hmm. Dr. Mincy. So, um, so so this is an evidence-based approach. I mean, are oh. are are these um, demonstration sites um, collecting data and actually seeing if some of these cornerstones and recommendations that you're coming up with are really resulting in um, you know higher uh, graduation rates for men of color? And uh, yes, this is okay. exactly the purpose of the project. Right. So uh, first of all. Uh, the stakeholders in the project are not only institutions of higher education, okay. but they are also community-based organizations that work in communities of color mm -hmm. who, in, who in the course of their work have come to the uh, understanding that, you know, unless we improve the rates of persistence and completion of men of color, mm -hmm. what they're trying to do in their communities won't be successful. So for, for one in, in mind is a, a development in corp corporation in Detroit, Michigan, okay. that played a critical role in uh, recovering students of color in Detroit from the debacle of, of high school education in Detroit when the school system was essentially taken over by the state. Yeah. Uh, and then they, uh, after having uh, figured out how to ensure that students whose high schools were open on Friday mm -hmm. but closed on Monday, uh, mm -hmm. they, they figured out how to uh, rearrange the, the opportunities for students to complete high school, they then raised their uh, vision and say, well, wait a minute, now that we've gotten a lot of these schools, uh, children graduated from high school, what about their college experience? Right. And so they worked with Wayne State College mm. uh, and got the attention of the, of the uh, president and provost at Wayne State College and uh, businesses in the community, other nonprofit organizations, in order to figure out how to in increase persistence and completion among men of color in Detroit. Okay. Uh, and they are now working on, um, they uh, hired a set of consultants and we provided technical assistance to them about how to do the, um, the 
the quantitative analysis around uh, the study of students as they move through the, the, the college system at Wayne State, mm -hmm. but we also did uh, technical assistance providing them uh, so that they can undertake focus groups mm -hmm. so that they could work with. It's a very diverse population, including African Americans, Latinos, Muslim students, a large portion of Asian students in Detroit, right. so that they could do focus groups with each of these subgroups of men of color so that they could glean from the students themselves what challenges they were facing in higher education and mm -hmm. what could be done about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the fact that this uh, very high-powered community development corporation in Detroit was able to sit across the table with the president of Wayne State University yeah. and talk about this problem provides a very important entry point for work that they're doing in the future. Okay, so uh, this mm -hmm. project was a catalyst for Ex exactly. you know, just uh, starting these conversations and getting some degree of cooperation uh, From as far as systems and policies change right exactly so we were we were worried about policy change and yeah. and therefore uh, and and my colleagues in the project Christine Robinson who mm -hmm. is a, a long-term uh, foundation executive who I worked with 20 years ago when I was at the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. uh, was was instrumental in in sort of making the connect between the major foundations that were supporting this at the executive alliance and local foundations who we hope will uh, provide the funding to continue the work that we catalyzed okay. uh, and similarly my other colleague uh, Luis Panuan. Uh, he is a uh, professor at the University of Texas and this is uh, higher education is really his specialty. Mm -hmm. My contribution to the area was was m mainly about uh, the number of men of color who were involved in systems, the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, child welfare, mm -hmm. and what are the implications of high levels of systems involvement for uh, these young men once they enter higher education. Yeah. And, uh, and I also provided uh, technical support around the quantitative and qualitative research that each of the sites needed to mm. undertake. Mm. Right. I, I, I believe one of these sites was Oakland, California. Yes. Um, and, um, and they were looking specifically, right, at right. the connections between um, well, incarceration? And I, exactly. So um, the other work that I'm very involved mm. in uh, now is um, uh, post-secondary education among formerly incarcerated students. So okay. I'm working with uh, uh, prisons in New York City and New York State, but also higher education institutions in New York State mm -hmm. about uh, what are we going to do when uh, students who have taken college coursework in prison leave. So approximately 700,000 prisoners in the United States are, are leaving prisons every day. Wow. And in the mid-1990s, the crime bill essentially shut down uh, uh, programs offering higher education in prison. And it was mm. private philanthropy that funded a lot of the, uh, uh, tried to rescue some of these programs. For, they uh, uh, formerly, uh, of offenders are not entitled to receive Pell Grants mm. uh, under current law and therefore um, a lot of the programs that were offering higher education shut down and it was private philanthropy that tried to fill some of that gap. Well now we are you know 20 years later and the number of students who are who take college coursework in prison has increased over time but what the early funders didn't anticipate is that eventually they were going to be released mm. and so now we have real critical issues about how do students who've taken their initial coursework in prison mm -hmm. how do they get credit for the coursework they've taken once they leave mm -hmm. uh, and so um, California, mm -hmm. Oakland, California in particular, has very high levels of incarceration and so their entire project was focused on formerly incarcerated students. Mm -hmm. And the primary thing I learned from this was that uh, we have, we're in a great situation in New York City and New York State mm -hmm. because um, we don't have the, the challenges with transfer agreements that you have in California. Mm -hmm. uh, we have institutions of higher learning that are willing to take the college courses uh, uh, that uh, students got while they were taking college coursework in other colleges mm. and accept those as credit when, st when students leave. And therefore, students can get credit for the coursework while they were incarcerated okay. and their, their progress toward their associate's degrees and their bachelor's degrees are much higher. Mm -hmm. In California, um, because they deal with a county-based criminal justice system and a county-based uh, and a, and a county educational system, California has the highest public education system in the country. Mm -hmm. But 
uh, the, 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 the jurisdictions that control the criminal justice system are not the same uh, jurisdictions that control access to public higher education. And so mm -hmm. you can take a course, uh, if you are incarcerated in Oakland and you go to a college uh, in Oakland in the same county, um, getting the criminal justice people and the education people together right. to figure out whether schools will accept your college coursework okay. is virtually impossible. And so um, it, it helped me to understand, again, what a, well, we have to continue to work that right, problem. Right. And we talk about that in the report. Mm. But, but it al also helped me to understand what a privilege we have in New York mm. that we, we have easy articulation agreements between schools that are offering college coursework in prison and schools that uh, can take these students once they leave. Mm. And it's just motivated me to be, you know, to, to fast forward the work that's underway in New York uh, because we have a real opportunity that other states around the country do not. Right, but it doesn't mean that we can take New York as a model and apply it to other <laughs> cities because they have their own local exactly. history and, right? Right, and, 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 challenges. and, right. and that was uh, an important part of the project that we had diversity in mm. terms of the places where we were. Mm. Uh, and so we could give um, uh, foundations and higher education institutions and other stakeholders in this work, examples on which they could build that match okay. their local situation. Because right. it was very clear that this idea that one size fits all mm. is not applicable to this uh, to this particular challenge. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some mm. questions from our audience that we can turn to mm. now. Um, when you speak of men of color, do you include Native Americans? How do your findings apply to all minorities? Well, um, yes, we do include we we did include Native American students uh, in many of our sites. Uh, there were particularly in, in Arkansas and in Detroit. Interestingly, mm. uh, many of the students that we work with uh, were were Native American students and Asian students. So this is a broad definition mm -hmm. of men of color. And and I think the the critical thing. So um, I've worked in work on fatherhood in in Native American populations. Mm. And um, and one of the things I learned as a consequence of the work is that their challenges are fundamentally different. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, um, it, it is the case, however, that they too tend to, those who go on to college tend to be first generation college students. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, what this is why, part of the reason why we sort of uh, provided technical assistance not only in the quantitative analysis of what students were going through mm -hmm. but also in, quali in qualitative analysis right. because we wanted the sites to be able to work with the students who were who were experiencing these challenges and get from the students their understanding mm -hmm. of their challenges with respect to right. higher education so that the solutions that they derive could be population mm -hmm. specific. So recognizing, mm -hmm. responding to the voices and needs. That's of, right. We, it was a very right. inclusive project. Yeah. They were Different there, men of color. There were different men of color. There were uh, gay and lesbian. Uh, there were gay gay students in the population mm. who have their own challenges sure. in higher education, and we yeah. wanted to make sure that we addressed you know the full uh, diversity of mm. the students we were trying to work with. Right. Um, is there research on best practices for recruiting young men of color in college access programs? Um, uh, I, I'm not so clear in, in the recruiting uh, portion of it um, because uh, in the United States there is a growth in what we call open access uh, colleges mm -hmm. because um, many people are going to school sort of long after their 20s uh, and therefore we've adapted in, in the United States to particularly two-year colleges in which we're uh, recruiting wide a wide variety of students into the college campus because people realize that they need higher education. Mm. The challenge is once they're admitted how do you for example are colleges offering courses in the evenings and on Saturdays because many of these men work mm. during the day and they're unable to attend college uh, classes if they're only offered a Thursday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And so the, the challenges have more to not, to not to do with recruitment, but what sorts of systems do college establish mm. that, in, that accommodate the needs of the students of color that we're, that we're working yeah. with? Yeah. Um, uh, so for example, in California, and this sort of blew my mind, mm. many of the male students of color with whom we were working in California mm. are homeless mm. because the price of housing in California in, in, uh, in Oakland is so expensive yeah. that, that many of the students are homeless, they're doubled up, and, um, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to imagine what going to school is like when you don't have a place to live, when you don't have a secure place to study. Mm. And this is a similar thing with formerly in incarcerated students okay. who face their own sorts of challenges. Right. Uh, uh, going back to your study and uh, thinking about the six different sites, so we've mentioned Oakland. Okay. Um, 
Little the, Rock, you the, said? Uh, it, Detroit? Uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Detroit, Michigan, Oakland, California, Los Angeles, California, mm. Newark, New Jersey, and, uh, and, and Buffalo, New York. And Buffalo. Th th those were the six So cents. how were they chosen? Or? Uh, they were chosen uh, through a competitive process, mm. but, but part of the, uh, the process was, again, we were doing this through the Executive Alliance for, with, for okay. Higher Education, yeah. and they already work with a community of foundations that is interested in this mm. uh, working with men and, men and boys of color, mm -hmm. and so they also encourage the local nonprofit organizations with whom that they normally fund for other things okay. to be engaged in this so process as well. Existing Leveraging networks, the existing, yeah. I mean, I used to work in the yeah. foundation community, and I understand that you form relationships mm. with organizations that have capacity, mm -hmm. but organizations that can deliver, mm. uh, and they and they try to um, identify which organizations were already in their grant portfolios yeah. that they had relationships with that had an interest and capacity to work on this topic, and then encourage them to submit proposals and the process move forward mm -hmm. and and hopefully again uh, we're meeting again uh, on, in November mm -hmm. to work with each of these six sites in order to identify local funders that would help these sites continue the work that they began mm -hmm. in the PSS project so was there anything I mean, and I know data is still coming in mm -hmm. and, and and the final analyses aren't aren't completed but um, something that surprised you um, you know, uh, as a um, result of this study? I, I, I guess the thing that surprised me, which should not have surprised me, mm. but the, the, here it is, that often students of, male students of color, because of the financial responsibilities that they have, are spending their financial aid in supporting the needs of their families. Oh. And, and they're also spending their financial aid on lots of developmental coursework for which they get no college credit. What's so developmental coursework? A developmental coursework, um, I was in the child welfare system when I, uh, from eight years old to 16 years old, and therefore I don't have a strong math background. Um, I, I oh, leave okay. high school without a strong math background, mm. and therefore, before I can take any college course, any coursework in math, uh, in, in college, for which I get credit, I have to take algebra, geometry, mm. and the like at the high school level that's offered by the college that I attend. Mm. So the college gives me that coursework mm -hmm. in order to prepare me to take college level math. I spend my and, financial yeah. aid, uh, and so I deplete my financial aid, and by the time I'm ready mm. to take uh, the college coursework, I've depleted 60% of the financial aid yeah. I have. And that happens in math, it happens in English, it happens in science, and so, uh, one of the things that really has to happen in this field is that colleges have, have, have got to figure out how to uh, build in simultaneously mm -hmm. developmental education courses and courses that for which college credit is offered yeah. so that students can at the same time acquire the skills that they need but take the college, take the courses mm -hmm. for which they will get college credit, which yeah. means that they are more likely to graduate on time right. and have some money left yeah. by the time they reach their senior year. Right. So this was like, a, uh, you know, people who are higher education experts understand this, mm. but other stakeholders in this field right. who are trying to get men of color through college have are clueless yeah. about how financial aid is operating. And, and it and seems like a, a good idea, right? Yeah, you know, no, develop, it's, it's, you know yeah. support, academic, and right. yeah, but it's in the and, actual... And so, so, so one of the things that we did in Detroit is, yeah. why can't some of these developmental education courses be offered by staff in the Community Development Corporation? So that you, okay. you, you take that responsibility off of the, the college, right. and as a result, the students can get the developmental education they need, mm. but their tuition isn't burned up in order right. to do that. And this is something that a local foundation could fund, mm. right? And so these are the strategies that we began to Creative think through. Solutions, and, yeah. and again, you couldn't get there unless we were in the weeds in each of the sites mm. trying to understand what are the barriers that these students face and how can a community of stakeholders, yeah. not just the institutions of higher education, work to resolve these things. Tremendous uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mincy, you said that when you were in college, you didn't trust anyone to help you with a plan B after your plan A, which was engineering, mm -hmm. failed. What kind of person could have helped you? Would you have preferred to find another man of color, a professor or administrator? Um, so uh, uh, I misspoke. I did. Mm. We had a um, 
We had an African American uh, uh, counselor who is a male. Mm. Uh, his name, I'm blanking on his last name because this was 40 years ago. And ultimately, I was able to sit down with him and, and, and talk about the, the barrier that I had hit in my physics course mm. and what Plan B was all about. But it took me a very long time to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, interestingly, I read um, that. Uh, first generation college students on Harvard's campus, which is where I went as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. um, have now begun to establish these things, these, these sorts of support groups, as a regular uh, institution within uh, four uh, for first generation college students who have little background in what college is all about mm -hmm. and establish places where they can go to, to get this kind of advice. But for me, um, it was a sort of a, I happened to find this person and he was able to give me the health, help that I need after a long time. But in many college campuses, this sort of support doesn't really exist. Yeah. Uh, and what we were trying to do is to figure out, well, uh, one of the things that schools may have to do is to increase the proportion of men of color who are administrators in higher education, who are faculty members in mm -hmm. higher education, so that that can occur. And also, uh, you can have proximal mentors. Uh, Upperclassmen who okay. are men of color can be available to lower classmen mm -hmm. when they hit these sorts of challenges so that they can support them mm -hmm. in getting through, so that mm -hmm. these students don't feel so isolated uh, and, and, and don't understand and where they can go to get the support. Um, when you arrive on the college campus, where is the writing center? Mm -hmm. uh, where is the where is the math lab? Mm -hmm. Where is the tutoring? And mm -hmm. then these ought to be part of the orientation package that students, men's, male students of color, receive when they arrive on the college campus, mm -hmm. so that they know where these resources are when they need them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, two final questions: um, How can all of us uh, watching support men of color in the university uh, more? in our day-to-day -day interactions. So um, my colleague, Luis uh, Panwan, uh, he posed this question to the, to the, to the group mm. uh, when we met in October of 2018. Mm. And we all sort of provided our ill-informed answers. And what his response was, get to know their names. Mm. In other words, how can I interact with a person yeah. and provide their support unless I become interested in who they are? Mm -hmm. And so what, what he began to talk about was a very simple solution that you begin to form personal relationships with, with male students of color, understanding that they may arrive on the college campus and feel very, very isolated. Mm. And so his, his, his step one was get to know their names yeah. so that when they encounter a challenge, uh, that student will remember that there was someone who, who was sufficiently locked into who I was to ask me my name, know who I was, know something about mm. my background, yeah. such that yeah. when I got into trouble, uh, I may not know where the right place to go was, but I could start with that person. And, and so yeah. uh, in, the, in the three seconds I have, that's the advice I would offer. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's important advice. Have you come across any post-secondary institutions that have implemented policies programs that serve as a model for best practices? Uh, 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 the, the one thing that we did yeah. was to destroy this idea that there was some model, model yeah. that could be followed. Right. Uh, wh what we clearly learned in going through our six mm. sites was there is no magic bullet for this, that, uh, that what we needed to do was to, and what in the replication of this effort, that um, communities need to form these collaborations mm -hmm. of institutions of higher education who are able to look into their lo local populations and see uh, the lack of success that is occurring among men of color. Mm -hmm. And then they need to work with other institutions that have access to them in their communities, yeah. form these collaborations, and then have uh, do the homework within mm -hmm. to understand, again, what are the challenges that students face as they move through, and to do the work without, namely, to get to the students themselves so that the students can describe the challenges that they're facing, and then use that data to, 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 to arrive at a plan for going forward, and then implement that plan, learn from the progress or lack thereof that is occurring mm. and move forward. I mean, I think uh, the, the idea that there is some magic bullet, th there's such diversity out there, really undermines the idea that there's one place that we can go to figure out how to do this. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Well, um, thank you again, Dr. Mincy, thank for you so joining much for us having here me. today at Social Impact Live. Mm. Uh, that concludes today's episode. Uh, we'll be joined next week by CSSW faculty member Alan Zwieben to discuss his work on motivational interviewing and the second edition of his book, Treating Addiction, A Guide for Professionals. So have a great week. Um, see you all next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.